Four decades after they parted ways, the Beatles still hold the top spot on every conceivable list of the greatest recording artists of all time. Not only do they beat all comers in the realms of critical and commercial success, no other pop act before or since has even come close to matching the Fab Four in terms of innovation and social impact. With pop music still in its infancy back in the early 60s, the lads from Liverpool broke so much musical, lyrical, stylistic and cultural ground that by the time they split in 1970, they'd left little new territory for successive generations of musicians to explore. As well as through their own catalogue of recordings, which continue to attract new fans every year, the Beatles have lived on through the legacy of their unmistakable influence on music ever since. There could be no doubt, however, that in creating such a hard act to follow, John, Paul, George and Ringo were also making a rod for their own backs, condemning themselves to a lifetime of comparison to their days as a Beatle. Whatever they chose to turn their hand to, their subsequent achievements would forever be judged against the unmatchable benchmark they'd set as a group. This is the story of what happened next. Often referred to as the first Beatle, John Lennon, along with his wife Yoko Ono, has often been blamed for the breakup of the supergroup. The story goes that after meeting Yoko at one of her exhibitions in 1966, John became more and more infatuated with the Japanese American conceptual artist. They began an affair in 1968, bringing about John's divorce from his first wife, Cynthia. From then on, he and Yoko were joined at the hip, frequently appearing in interviews together, like this one, in which they extolled the virtues of a form of expression known as howling. Communicate with you, you know, and there you don't intellectualize communication, you just howl, you know. But how does a howl think that's uh, uh, an expression that's not so intellectualized as words, you know? It's just like uh, pure sound. Show me, show me it's pure sound. Is. Well, anything. Ah, oh, oh, that's howling. Ah, you know, something like that. Not only did they record their own avant-garde music together, John also insisted that Yoko be allowed artistic input into the Beatles recordings, widening the cracks that had already begun to appear within the band. What about another word? In 1969, John and Yoko formed the Plastic Ono Band, which included Eric Clapton on lead guitar. The rapturous reception they received at that year's Toronto Rock and Roll Revival and the success of their anti-war anthem, Give Peace a Chance, which was written during John and Yoko's famous bed-in honeymoon, consolidated John's decision to leave the Beatles. Despite subsequent renegotiations of a new contract, it was all over bar the shouting, and John was already well on his way to a successful solo career. The following year, he explored the pain of losing his mother and splitting from the Beatles in John Lennon Plastic Ono Band, which featured the song Working Class Hero, complete with the famous expletive that saw it banned from BBC Radio. The change in artistic direction came with a new haircut, which saw him casting off his famous flowing locks and sporting a short back and sides. We just got cheesed off with it, you know. It was getting in my ears. And I, it just the same way I grew it, you know. I just felt like having it. Now I feel like having it short. It's, it's for the new year, you know. We wanted a new year head, you know. I don't, I don't want to sound unkind, but don't you think that um, this may have been construed as just another Lennon stunt? Well, we tried to keep It'd it quiet. Nice we, I don't mm -hmm. care. It came useful for this, you know. Yeah. yeah, the more stunts the better. But when mm -hmm. we cut it, we didn't think of that. We were just cutting it in private in the farmhouse. And I asked the chick that cut it to be quiet, and she lasted three days before she broke the news. Because I, I could have driven around Europe, you see, in disguise, nobody would have known, but she just couldn't keep her mouth shut. <laughs> Being granted the luxury of anonymity was just one of the hopes John Lennon held for the future. 
In the title track of his 1971 album, Imagine, he listed many more. Written as a plea for world peace, the song would quickly go on to become his signature tune and remains by far the most popular of all his solo works. The album, which he co-produced with Phil Spector and Yoko, also included Jealous Guy and the song How Do You Sleep, which pulled no punches in its unveiled attacks on his former songwriting partner, Paul McCartney. Over the next few years, he and Yoko collaborated on more anti-war songs, like Happy Christmas, War Is Over. Their 1972 album, Some Time in New York City, focused its attentions on race relations and women's rights. It kicked off with a song called Woman is the Nigger of the World, which, like Working Class Hero, was banned from radio airplay. And much to his reluctance, John was being hailed as the leader of a social revolution. In between releasing his own singles and albums and his work with Yoko, John collaborated with a host of other artists. As well as writing songs for Ringo Starr, he produced Mick Jagger's song, Too Many Cooks Spoil the Soup, and co-wrote David Bowie's first US number one single, Fame. He also scored his own US number one with Whatever Gets You Through the Night, which featured Elton John on backing vocals and piano. But while things were ticking away nicely on the professional front, John's home life was far from settled. The relationship with Yoko had become very strained in the wake of their 1968 arrest for possession of cannabis resin, with John facing almost certain deportation from the United States. He began drinking heavily while Yoko became more and more focused on her work. In 1973, Yoko decided they should separate for a while and suggested John take up with their personal assistant, Mei Pang. He and Mei ended up living together in LA for an 18-month period that John subsequently referred to as his lost weekend. Long believed to be a bleak period in John's life, involving booze-filled recording sessions and altercations with other musicians, May contends they shared plenty of happy times together and recently decided to release a collection of photographs in an exhibition called Time Remembered. People think he was a, a very depressed, very uh, down and out and, and drunk all the time. And I said, and I started thinking about it and I said, you know, maybe it is time because it, it's not only for me, but you know, the myth has to be broken about that time period. And I thought it's also for him. During his time out from Yoko, John took the opportunity to get reacquainted with his son Julian from his first marriage to Cynthia and made up with Paul McCartney. For May, narrowing down photos of their time together proved a big challenge. It was, I only chose nine because that was John's number, number nine, number nine, and I thought, you know what, I don't want to do more than nine. I just want to keep that going. I think we got a good selection this year, and then next year will be a different nine, or something else comes out and goes in. By 1975, it was out with Mei Pang and back in with Yoko Ono. In October, Yoko gave birth to their son, Sean, and John became a virtual recluse, retiring from music and playing stay-at-home father to Sean at the Dakota in New York. Away from the recording studio, he indulged himself in another of his many creative talents, drawing. Long before becoming a musical legend, John had studied art in his native Liverpool, and he continued to draw throughout his career with the Beatles, adopting a more sparse style of line drawing. He did his original, his first collection, as a wedding gift for Yoko Ono when they got married. And that went on exhibition in London just after the wedding. And that was raided by the police for obscenity. <laughs> so that was the end of, uh, of that exhibition. At a much more recent exhibition of his work, gallery owner Judith Nipkin was particularly struck by the artist's whimsical humour. I don't think it's possible to separate the man from the art. I think it's John Lennon. Um, 
I think the art, the art is great. It's they're amusing. They're just a, a, a few lines, and you've got these these wonderful pictures, these wonderful images. Um, and I think it's a piece of history. It's a piece a piece of social history. After five years of silence, John finally headed back into the studio with Yoko. Legend has it that he'd been happy to sit back as long as Paul McCartney was producing, as he put it, garbage. But upon hearing Paul's single, Coming Up, he confessed he couldn't get the song out of his head and felt compelled to get back to work. The resulting 1980 album was billed as his comeback. Double Fantasy showed his softer, more mature side and was packed with odes to his family, such as Beautiful Boy, Woman, and Just Like Starting Over. In interviews to promote the album, John declared he was happier now than at any other point in his life, and he wrote a song called Life Begins at 40 to prove it. Tragically for John Lennon, life was also destined to end at 40. Just three weeks after the release of Double Fantasy, he was gunned down on the way into his apartment building. On December the 8th at 10.50 p.m., he was following Yoko into the Dakota when 25-year-old Mark Chapman stepped out of the shadows and fired five shots. Four found their mark, and at 11.21, John Lennon was pronounced dead on arrival at the Roosevelt Hospital. Just six hours earlier, he had unwittingly handed his murderer an autographed copy of Double Fantasy on his way out to the recording studio. As soon as news broke of the tragedy, the world united with Yoko in shock and grief and flocked to the scene of his murder. The following day, she issued a statement explaining that there would be no funeral, saying John loved and prayed for the human race. Please do the same for him. Love, Yoko and Sean. Vigils took place around the world the following Sunday the largest of which saw some 100,000 mourners observing a 10-minute silence in New York's Central Park. Every year since then, fans have been gathering outside the imagined circle at Strawberry Fields in Central Park to pay tribute to their hero and his message of peace. Mark Chapman was convicted of second-degree murder and sentenced to 20 years to life. He since applied for parole five times, claiming to be over his delusions. So far, however, his appeals have been denied by the parole board, perhaps as much for his own protection as for that of the general public. I think for Mr. Chapman's own safety, it might be a good idea for him to stay you know, in prison um, because there's a lot of uh, people who are more of Lennon fans than we are that could take that to extremes and he, his life could be in danger. I think that he really needs to actually stay in there. Let him suffer. Let him suffer the way and let him feel the hurt that everyone else felt when John Lennon was killed. Meanwhile, Yoko has remained true to the message of peace and love she and John epitomized with their bed-ins 40 years ago. Having forgiven Mark Chapman for murdering her soulmate, she recently reflected upon what John would have thought of the world today. Well, he would have been very upset that uh, it's sunny, a very violent world again. You know, he was a peacenik, you know. But I think that he would have been excited about the internet, website, all that. <laughs> and as fans gathered to mark the 25th anniversary of his death in New York, she was cheered by the obvious immortality of his widespread influence. I think the whole world, not just the musicians, I was totally influenced by his thoughts, his music, and um, good, for, good for the world, actually. It's great, yeah. On a personal level, however, there's no doubt that she still misses him terribly. We'd have been loving. <laughs> uh, it's just that, you know, when I hear Grohl's with me, that's the one that chokes me up because well, you know, he, he was saying girls with me to me, and well, now he's saying to everybody, I suppose, so to the world, so that's good. After waking to the news of John Lennon's death on the morning of December 9th, 1980, Paul McCartney holed himself up in an Oxford Street studio in London 
and spent the day listening to music. When he emerged later that evening, he was swamped by reporters clamouring for his reaction to John's death. Clearly drained and uncomfortable with all the attention, he replied that he was shocked at the terrible news and added the comment, it's a drag, isn't it? Which instantly earned him a pasting in the press. Paul later confessed that he regretted the remark, claiming that he had intended no disrespect, but that he had been at a loss for words. The tragic passing of his former songwriting partner had temporarily silenced an artist who was on his way to becoming the most successful musician and composer in popular music history. With more number ones over the course of his 45-year career than any other artist. Just one year earlier, the Guinness Book of Records had honoured his achievements with the presentation of a rhodium disc. But even then, he'd seemed ill at ease with members of the press. Jack, the award covers a period of 16 years, something like that. Would you briefly just sort of go through those 16 years and tell me a few of the highlights for you? No. I mean, we've all got our own personal memories. Oh, 16 years you want me to go through? No, just, just well, pick well, out one or two of the highlights, Paul. Of the highlights of my career, the things that as stand, we see it The things today. that stand out in your own memory. Oh, oh. Um, meeting Jimmy Savile in the back of a van and hearing about his army exploits. That was a big one. Meeting the Queen. Um, <laughs> come on. Be sensible now. That's right. Um, 16 years, I don't know, going to America the first time, getting a number one in America, um, going on our last tour with Wings to America and playing Seattle Kingdom uh, in front of like about 67,000 people, couldn't see one of them. Mm. Uh, and meeting you has been basically the high spot mm. of the whole 16 years, actually. When we look at your... Perhaps his reluctance to hobnob with the media could be traced back to his much publicised split from the Beatles. Although John, George and Ringo all voiced their intentions to quit the band over the course of the late 60s, it was Paul who officially banged the nail in the coffin by announcing their breakup on April 10, 1970, just one week ahead of the release of his first solo album, McCartney. He was also the driving force behind the legal dissolution of the Beatles' partnership. As the reason for his departure, Paul cited personal differences, business differences and musical differences, but most of all, he claimed, because he had a better time with his family. Press manager Derek Taylor was immediately put on the spot. Now, does this mean a business or emotional split within the Beatles? Mm -hmm. I should think a bit of both, but I think it's more of a break. He answers himself that he doesn't know whether it's temporary or permanent. That's the truth. Mm -hmm. I think none of us know that. Aside from the personal and creative rifts that had been opening up within the band, one of Paul's biggest bones of contention was the appointment of Alan Klein as business manager of the band's record company, Apple. Alan Klein's name is mentioned, and Alan Klein uh, is definitely disowned in this question and answer by Why? Paul. By Paul. Because he doesn't uh, like Alan Klein. Why doesn't he like him? I don't know, but he doesn't. Apparently, Paul had never trusted the abrasive New Yorker, despite the fact that Klein had renegotiated the Beatles' contract with EMI, handing them the highest royalties ever granted to an artist at the time. Meanwhile, the tough-talking Klein wasn't flinching. <laughs> what do you feel about the fact that Paul apparently is definitely dissociating himself from you? It appears that he's antipathetic to you. Well, it's never pleasant when someone uh, appears not to like you. Uh, I think his reasons are... Uh, are sick. I think they're his own personal problems. But uh, unfortunately, he is um, obligated into Apple for a considerable number of years, so uh, his disassociating himself with me um, has really no effect. But rather than allow Klein to milk the Beatles and diminish their artistic legacy, 
Paul acted to legally dissolve the band's partnership the following year. On his visits to the courthouse, he was accompanied by his American wife of two years, Linda, whom he credited with giving him the strength to work again after the Beatles' breakup. They'd met in 1967, when Linda was on assignment to photograph swinging 60s musicians in London. Paul was immediately impressed with her talent as a photographer. By the time the Beatles split up, Paul and Linda had already had one child together, called Mary. Paul had also adopted Linda's daughter, Heather, from her first marriage. While John was collaborating with Yoko over in New York, Paul invited input from Linda on his second solo effort, Ram, which reached number one in the UK and number two in the US. In 1971, the husband and wife team were joined by guitarist Denny Lane and drummer Denny Sewell, who completed the lineup of the new band Wings. Although Linda often drew derision for her weak vocals and awkward stage presence, Wings would go on to enjoy a great deal of critical and commercial success over the next 10 years. As well as reuniting with Beatles producer George Martin to record the theme song to the 1973 James Bond film Live and Let Die, they won two Grammy Awards the same year for their album Band on the Run. Other hits included Mull of Kintyre, Silly Love Songs and With a Little Luck. After John died in 1980, Paul was nervous about touring and ended up disbanding Wings the following year, but that didn't slow his musical output. On his second solo album, McCartney 2, which featured the lead single, Coming Up, he played every single instrument, and throughout the decade, he would collaborate with a host of other artists, including the hit single, The Girl Is Mine, with Michael Jackson, and Ebony and Ivory, with Stevie Wonder. He also struck up a songwriting partnership with Elvis Costello, which spawned Elvis's hit, Veronica. Like John and Yoko, Paul and Linda also faced legal challenges over their use of drugs. During the 70s, police had found marijuana growing on his farm in Scotland, and in 1980, Paul was arrested in Japan for carrying seven and a half ounces of cannabis in his luggage. Four years later, they were busted once again in Barbados. Towards the end of the decade, it was time to get back out on the road with his new band lineup to promote his latest album, Flowers in the Dirt. Once you've got a band going, you start to feel like going on tour. You think, well, let's get out of this room and go to another room. So it's really that. We've got a nice band that we enjoy playing with each other. And um, so we're going on tour. 19 years after the Beatles had broken up, he was still being asked about a possible reunion. Um, obviously, uh, the Beatles can't get back together again because John died. Um, and to me, that was the ultimate thing. You know, even though people have suggested uh, that the three of us work with Julian, I don't think you can replace John. Um, he's just such a key factor, you know, it's impossible. And I wouldn't even want to try that. But uh, as far as maybe me, Ringo and George working together again in some form, maybe playing together or making some songs together, That'd be the first move. In fact, the first move was teaming up with George and Ringo in the 1990s to put together Apple's The Beatles Anthology documentary series, which included three double albums of previously unreleased material and a 10-hour video box set. Sadly, however, the late 90s were marred by Linda's battle with breast cancer. Through her profile as an animal rights activist and author of vegetarian cookbooks, Linda had become a national icon in her own right, and Britain joined Paul and their children Heather, Mary, Stella and James in mourning her loss in April 1998. The same British public were left reeling less than two years later when Paul, or rather Sir Paul, was spotted squiring former model Heather Mills to several public events. Clearly besotted with the anti-landmine campaigner, he ignored the public outcry and pressed ahead with the courtship, much to the well-publicized disgust of his designer daughter, Stella, who was just three years younger than Heather. Sir Paul and Heather were married in front of 300 guests in a lavish ceremony at Castle Leslie in Scotland, and in 2003, 
they had a daughter called Beatrice Millie. Heather set about convincing Paul's friends and fans that she was a worthy successor to St. Linda. Not only did she step up her involvement in anti-landmine campaigns, she took up Linda's mantle as an animal rights activist, becoming a vocal supporter of the people for the ethical treatment of animals. But all her hard work fell on fallow ground, with Paul's nearest and dearest refusing to relinquish their mistrust of the glamorous amputee. The media were relentless in their determination to dig up details of her murky past, spreading rumors that she had formerly worked as a high-class prostitute. And in 2005, they hit pay dirt. Branding her Lady Mucker, a British tabloid published semi-pornographic photos taken of her for the 1988 book, The Joys of Love. Humiliated and embarrassed by the stories, Sir Paul initially defended his wife, but in May 2006, it was announced that they were separating and the mudslinging began in earnest. Heather opened her account by accusing Sir Paul of regularly physically abusing her while under the influence of drink and drugs. While Paul kept quiet, his friends and supporters were vitriolic in response. She is trying to desperately destroy a legend. She's destroying a national treasure. I don't know what she's playing at. I think she's a very, very wicked saddo who needs an awful lot of help. A saddo that stood to win up to a quarter of Paul's estimated 800 million pound fortune after just four years of marriage. In the end, however, she had to settle for a lump sum of 24 and a half million pounds along with eight million pounds worth of assets, plus 35,000 a year in child support. But even while he was riding out what became known as the split of the decade, Paul never stopped working. While off on a two-year world tour during which he headlined Glastonbury Festival, he wrote a behind-the-scenes book called Paul McCartney On Stage, Off Stage and Backstage. He also completed his third classical work, Ecce Cormeum. Eight years in the making, it premiered at the Royal Albert Hall in November of 2006. Already separated from Heather at this stage, he was free to talk about the real inspiration behind the work. It was started when Linda was alive and we originally went up to Maudlin together. So um, it has a lot of my feelings for her in it. Uh, when she died, it, it uh, stalled me and I, I, it took a year or so before I could get back into it. And um, the interlude in the middle, the particularly sad melody, is what got me going again. Um, so her spirit is very much in this. It would have been her birthday yesterday, so uh, pretty appropriate. There was also the 2005 album, Chaos and Creation in the Backyard, and 2007's Memory Almost Full. I like the phrase, Memory Almost Full, because it seems symbolic of uh, our life today. I think, you know, the life moves so fast, and not just for me, for many people. You know, your messages are always full, and your mind's full. You know, it doesn't matter if you're my age or 20. Um, I think, you know, we, we, we need to delete stuff every so often, like I needed to delete my messages and you didn't need to delete facts now just to clear your mind so that was what appealed to me i thought it was like um, symbolic of how we live so it's not really to do with my memory and on the promotional trail of his 22nd solo album he proved he could still pull in the screaming fans these are tears of happiness. I love Paul McCartney. And I can't believe I'm actually going to meet him. So it's all tears of happiness, yes. At the age of 65, that was good enough for Paul to put off any thoughts of retiring. Since then, he's picked up an Ultimate Legend Award from MTV, performed his first ever concert in Israel, and signed up with Starbucks label Hear Music. And despite the disastrous end to his second marriage, neither has he given up on love. Even before his divorce from Heather became final, he'd begun dating trucking heiress Nancy Chevelle, proving that there's still plenty of life in the old Beatle yet. 
I'll do it as long as they like it and I like it. Despite his incredible gifts as a musician-songwriter, George Harrison was destined to remain eternally overshadowed by fellow Beatles John Lennon and Paul McCartney. Maybe this was due to him being the most junior member of the group, or perhaps it had more to do with his famously shy nature, which earned him the nickname The Quiet Beatle. Towards the end of the 60s, however, George's songwriting talents were garnering more and more recognition. His song, Something, was covered by Frank Sinatra, who declared it one of the greatest songs of the last 20 years. Despite this, Paul's gripes about his guitar playing were wearing him down, and George walked out twice. On top of that, he had to contend with being arrested and charged for marijuana possession. He and his wife, Patty, were found guilty and fined £250 each. After the Beatles split in 1970, George was quoted as saying, the biggest break in my career was getting into the Beatles in 1962. The second biggest break since then is getting out of them. By then, he'd amassed a backlog of his own material, and he was first out of the blocks with his solo effort, All Things Must Pass. The sheer volume of material on the triple album confirmed the feelings of many fans that his songs had been stifled by the Beatles. All Things Must Pass was a massive hit, but one of the most famous songs of the album, My Sweet Lord, got him into legal trouble because of its similarity to the 1963 Chiffon's hit, He's So Fine. He was sued for copyright infringement. George denied deliberately stealing the song but he ended up losing the case in 1976. The battle over damages dragged on until the 1990s. Meanwhile, he remained steeped in the Indian culture and Hinduism he'd embraced in the late 60s. As well as studying meditation with Maharashi Mahesh Yogi, along with the rest of the band, he developed a close friendship with sitar player Ravi Shankar and recorded a film score in Bombay. In 1971, he and Ravi organized what is now recognized as the first major charity concert. With a heavyweight lineup that included Eric Clapton, Bob Dylan and Ringo Starr, the concert for Bangladesh took place in New York's Madison Square Garden in front of 40,000 fans. He, uh, he often said that, uh, you know, people need to be inspired and, and people also need a vehicle through which they can channel their, you know, their compassion and their generosity. And, and I think that that was the most important thing he discovered. Proceeds were supposed to aid refugees in the war in Bangladesh. However, tax issues and questionable expenses conspired to thwart his good intentions and gobble up the funds. By 1974, his first marriage to Patty was over. Things had started to go wrong early in their marriage, and Patty ended up hooking up with George's good friend, Eric Clapton. Despite the betrayal, George and Eric remained close and jokingly referred to each other as husbands-in-law. He settled into some stability with his new wife, Olivia Arias, in 1978 and continued pumping out the solo albums and collaborating with other artists like Harry Nilsson and Billy Preston, as well as John and Ringo. He also set up his own film company, Handmade Films, which produced the Monty Python movies. But in 1980, he was shocked to the core by John's assassination. Never trusting the adulation of obsessive fans, George had long been afraid of the danger posed by stalkers. He often refused to promote his own albums and films, earning himself the nickname the Howard Hughes of rock. In his autobiography, I, Me, Mine, he wrote, I don't want to be in the business full time because I'm a gardener. I plant flowers and watch them grow. I don't go out to clubs and parties. I stay at home and watch the river flow. In 1987, however, he dragged himself out to promote his new album, Cloud Nine. The album spawned the hit single, Got My Mind Set On You, and he set off for a concert tour of Japan, supported by Eric Clapton. 
He also teamed up with Bob Dylan, Roy Orbison and Tom Petty to form the Travelling Wilburys. In 1997, he reunited with his old friend Ravi Shankar to record a new album, Chants of India, based on ancient Indian mantras. It was just a great excuse to be able to surround myself with these great musicians and the great words that are being said in this Sanskrit, because um, it was quite a blessing, really. And so it is a spiritual experience, but it's all down to the individual, you know, what you can uh, manifest within yourself as to the value of anything. Really, the whole of life should be a spiritual experience because we are spirits who are just encased in bodies. People forget that and think they're just this body, but we're actually spirits in bodies. Then suddenly, two years later, his old nightmares came back to haunt him when an intruder broke into his family home in Henley-on-Thames in England and stabbed him several times. Although George was left with a punctured lung, he and Olivia managed to restrain the attacker and detain him until the police arrived to arrest him. In court, 33-year-old Michael Abram claimed he was possessed by George and had been on a mission from God to kill him. In the end, Abram was acquitted on the grounds of insanity. Despite his bravery in the face of such danger, George was so traumatized by the event that he rarely ventured out in public again. Whether or not his injuries contributed to the re-emergence of the cancer that had first shown up in 1997 is a matter of speculation. A former heavy smoker, the disease was first diagnosed in his throat and he ended up having growths removed from his throat and then his lungs. It's going to have the potential to spread. One of the areas it can spread to is the lung, another is the brain. If it's a separate cancer in the lung, that too can spread on its own to the brain. But it's likely that they're related, and the more cancer you have, the more difficult it is to treat, I'm afraid. But by 2001, the cancer had returned, spreading to his brain. Despite aggressive treatment, the tumor was found to be terminal, giving George just enough time to work on songs with his son, Dani, that were released as the album Brainwashed after his death. He spent the final months with his family and died in Hollywood Hills on the 29th of November 2001 at the age of 58. His dying request was that his ashes be scattered in the River Ganges and after his death his family released this statement. He left this world as he lived in it, conscious of God, fearless of death and at peace, surrounded by family and friends. Flowers and tributes from fans started pouring in. I will just think of how he had such an effect on my life and not how he, you know, not how his life was ended, but more so how, how important his music was for our culture and for the world. I love him because he cared about the environment. I love him for his music. He brought joy to my heart and many other people's hearts starting in 1964, and I thank him for that. And he wasn't about to be forgotten. First, there was the memorial concert in his honor on the first anniversary of his death, which raised money for his charity, the Material World Foundation. A year later, he was ranked 21 on Rolling Stone's list of the greatest guitarists of all time. And in 2004, he was inducted as a solo artist into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Then in 2005, George's widow, Olivia, staged a star-studded launch of the DVD of his 1971 concert for Bangladesh. Because, uh, you know, musically, it is a little bit of history, because uh, it's one of those things you'll never get those guys together again. And so it's important, I think. And the legacy? And the show was great. The launch also included performances by his old collaborators Ringo Starr and Billy Preston, as well as his son Darnie, who also worked on the project. Finally, in April 2009, he was posthumously awarded his own star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Alongside Paul McCartney, celebrities queuing up to pay George their respects were Monty Python member Eric Idle and film star Tom Hanks. 
Let us thank them all for making life worth living that much more. Every record was an event. Every cut was an opera. The entire story told ours. All things must pass, sure. But George is going to live forever. Thank you very much. But the last word went to Olivia. We all have deep feelings for George because he was such a deep feeling person. Once you met him, you, you couldn't help but be drawn into his world. And, and he wanted to be in your world too. To me, he was a, a beautiful, mystical man living in a material world. And he was as funny as the day is long and just as perplexing. Uh, I think I speak for all of us when I say that as time passes, we discover more and more how deeply seated he is in our hearts and our lives. So thank you, everyone. Uh, George, this day is for you. And as for how he will be remembered. You know, I think of him singing Taxman, probably, or something. Or I just think of a great songwriter who, in a way, was in a group with two unbelievably fantastic songwriters as well, you know, and was able to still shine through, you know. Often seen as the clown of the group, Richard Starkey, a.k.a. Ringo Starr, endured his fair share of ribbing from the rest of the band. Once asked if Ringo was the best drummer in the world, John Lennon famously replied, he's not even the best drummer in the Beatles. In fact, Ringo was always the first to acknowledge his technical limitations, admitting, whenever I hear another drummer, I know I'm not good on the technical things. I'm your basic offbeat drummer with funny fills. The fact that he was a left-handed drummer playing on a right-handed kit didn't help matters. But despite those limitations, the band's producer, George Martin, was quoted as saying, even though he couldn't do a roll to save his life, he's got tremendous feel. He always helped us hit the right tempo for a song and gave it that support, that solid backbeat. He earned a reputation for being incredibly consistent and reliable, rarely making a mistake. And as pop music's first superstar drummer, he paved the way for later upfront beat merchants like Phil Collins, Dave Grohl, and Nico McBrain from Iron Maiden. While he languished in the shadows of John, Paul, and George on the songwriting front, it soon became clear that none of the others could match Ringo's dramatic abilities. After appearing alongside the rest of the band in their movies Hard Day's Night and Help, he was lauded for his natural acting talent. After the release of Help in 1966, he talked of wanting to do more films and gave an insight into the frustrations he faced waiting for other people to come up with new material for him to play. I'm sort of out of it there because with John and Paul, they can still write even though we're sort of not working together. And George can, you know, learn his sitar and do things like that. And I've just been sitting around. Getting bored? Uh, no, getting fat. <laughs> When the Beatles finally parted ways in April 1970, there was no more sitting round for Ringo. He'd released two solo albums by the end of the year. First came Sentimental Journey, featuring his versions of a collection of rock standards. Then Boku of Blues, a country-flavoured album that brought him two hit singles. The dependence on others that had led to so many wasted hours had taught him to deepen his pool of collaborators, and throughout the 70s, he worked with a startling array of artists and musicians from all kinds of genres. As well as pulling in the arranging talents of Quincy Jones, Morris Gibb and George Martin, he called on all his former bandmates to write songs for his solo albums. He returned favours by taking part in George's Concert for Bangladesh and playing on John's solo efforts. He also appeared in a few more movies, debuted as a film director, started a furniture company, and the record label Ringo Records. In the middle of that came the divorce from his first wife, Maureen, 
with whom he'd had three sons, Zach, Jason and Lee. In 1980, on the set of the slapstick comedy Caveman, he met and fell in love with former Bond girl Barbara Bach. After John's murder that December, they flew to New York together to comfort Yoko. They got married in April 1981 at London's Marylebone Registry Office. With John's shooting still fresh in everyone's mind, they tried to keep the wedding secret, but after word got out, around 30 security officers were employed to keep the surviving Beatles and their families safe in the ensuing crush. Over the next couple of years, Ringo continued collaborating with his former bandmates and released two more albums, Stop and Smell the Roses and Old Wave. Then in 1985, he became the voice of Thomas the Tank Engine in the popular animated TV series. By 1988, however, his famous partying lifestyle had got the better of him and both he and Barbara checked themselves into a detox clinic in Tucson and underwent a six-week program for alcoholism. Within 12 months, he bounced back to form the All-Star Band, the first in what was to become a revolving lineup of well-known musos included Nils Lovgren, Joe Walsh, Billy Preston, and Jim Keltner. Todd Rundgren, Howard Jones, John Entwistle, Peter Frampton, Richard Marks, Colin Hay, and Ringo's drummer son, Zach, have been some of the All-Star Band's most notable inclusions. I feel blessed that, uh, you know, I get the opportunity to play with these youngsters. And, uh, you know, I, I feel blessed to play with all musicians, really, and I'm blessed that I'm still playing. So I think you, more than us, deal with uh, the youngsters and the oldies, you know? I mean, I, I suppose I have to end up playing with, like, B.B. King to be the youngster. <laughs> Even though he's been getting out and about with the All-Stars for two decades, Ringo still gets asked about how they compare to the Beatles. That was great, this is great. Um, you know, it was, um, it was all new, a lot newer then. And uh, so, you know, I think what people don't understand is that, uh, you know, we're, we're players, we're musicians, and, you know, I. Though the Beatles were those big icons and the haircuts and whatever else, underneath all of that were these four musicians, and that was the main deal. Having said that, he and Paul have also been doing it together. Over the past few years, they have worked on a number of Beatles projects, including 2007's collaboration with Cirque du Soleil. People tell me there ain't no use in trying. To provide the soundtrack to the show Love, George Martin and his son Giles took the entire Beatles catalogue from tape and used these original recordings to create a sound bed that covered the whole Beatles lifespan in a very condensed period. The most exciting thing for me was the width and the breadth of the, of the, of the brief that they gave me. They said you can do anything you like. You can go go through all the Beatle tapes and use any bit of it you like. They gave me carte blanche. And I, when I told Jars about this, I said, you've got to work with me on this. And he got excited about it too. And um, it was a responsible thing, of course, because you can't, you're doing outlandish things that you hope the people will approve of, and you're wondering whether you've gone too far. The launch of the spectacular show was marked by a special dedication ceremony for John and George. Two years later, they were representing their late bandmates again at the launch of The Beatles Rock Band, a video game that puts players on stage as members of the legendary group and allows them to play their material from a catalogue of 45 songs. Four decades on from their famous final performance on the rooftop of Apple HQ in London, Paul and Ringo had lost none of their on-stage chemistry. Watch his Good morning, everybody. Thank you. Welcome. All right. 
Looks like they want us to talk amongst ourselves, Paul. Yeah, I think so. I what do you think of the game? I love it. I love it. You love game. it? Yeah. I okay. can't play it. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, no, no. Say a bit more. Say a bit more. Yeah. Oh, the game is good. The graphics are very good. And uh, we were great. Now, uh, it, we love the game, it's fantastic. Who, had, who would ever thought we'd uh, end up as androids? But um, I like the way I walk. <laughs> yeah, so thank you very much for having us here and uh, having us on your game show. <laughs> we love it. <laughs> it's wonderful. Anyway, uh, God bless, peace and love. Thank you. Yeah. Enjoy the game. Thank you. Whoa. Aside from touring with the all-star band and turning out for never-ending Beatles-related launches, Ringo also recently threw himself into an ambitious collaboration with ex-Eurythmic Dave Stewart. Their album, Liverpool 8, coincided with the start of a year of events in Ringo's hometown to highlight its growing cultural importance. He and Dave kicked off the city's year-long celebrations with a concert on the roof of St George's Hall in the city centre. The next night, Ringo was due to take centre stage again in Liverpool the Musical at the brand new Echo Arena. All of that. Well, so far it's great. You know, it's a brand new arena. It's cool. Ringo, the atmosphere? It's the best arena in Liverpool. And Ringo's fellow Liverpudlians agreed he still had what it took to get the crowd going. Oh, we've had a really good night. It's been absolutely brilliant. Um, Ringo Starr was really good. Fast approaching the big 7-0, Ringo was finding himself busier than ever. So busy, in fact, that he decided to put an end to signing autographs. In a message posted on ringostar.com in October 2008, he declared, I'm warning you with peace and love. I have too much to do, so no more fan mail. Thank you, thank you, and no objects to be signed. Nothing. Anyway, peace and love, peace and love. And in the words of the Beatles' final album, Let It Be.